As you'll discover throughout the semester, there are a number of words that economists use with slightly different meanings than we use them in everyday English. And technology is one of those words. So when we think of technology, you know, in every day, we think about smartphones and robots and, you know, LCD TVs, all the new things that we can produce. And that's certainly a part of the economic definition of technology. But when we talk about technology and economics, we're really talking about any new process, any new way that we can take existing inputs and turn them into new outputs or just more outputs. So technology could be the introduction of robots in the assembly line, but it could also be the introduction of new management techniques that take the same number of inputs, but because it's being better managed, the process is being better managed, we can produce more output. And Economic growth is really all about taking those inputs, whether that's labor, capital, land, and turning them in to more output, right? And the more we can do that, then the more we can increase our living standards. The more leisure we can have, the more stuff we can have, the more food we can have. And that's really where economic growth comes from. And so it's no surprise that that, time, that little kink in the, the growth curve that we saw in the 17th uh, and then more in the 18th century in Britain really came about at the time of you know, amazing scientific and technological advances, right? And those have continued throughout with sometimes, you know, we're seeing faster technological growth than other times, but it has really continued uh, pretty steadily since then. So just as one example, uh, this is a, a graph of how many uh, lumen hours per hour of labor we are able to produce, right? So how much light can we produce per hour of work? Um, and you can see that it was pretty flat, right? We can make a fire. That's what we can make a fire. We can make a fire. We can make a fire. Oh, we can make a lamp. Oh, we can make electricity. And you can see it's just grown astronomically, right? Now we can produce pretty much as much light as we want um, with very little labor. And so the Industrial Revolution uh, took all these technological advances and started to create a whole bunch of new products and services that took us from a world in which almost everybody had to be a farmer just to produce enough food for everybody into a world in which very few people are farmers uh, and we can create more of everything and more new things than we would ever have thought possible. Another way to look at this is how fast information traveled, right? And so information basically traveled at about one mile per hour uh, going back to about 1800, right? So, you know, people can walk a mile an hour very easily. Obviously, you know, if you think about the marathon runner in ancient Greece, then there are some times where information can, can move more quickly. Uh, but basically, you know, n events are going to travel at about one mile an hour in terms of how fast people know about them. And so here's, there's some examples here uh, between Egypt and Italy, uh, between Venice and Damascus, uh, and then as, as we get fa better technology, we get faster ships, we get trains, we get the telegraph, we get the telephone, and then of course with the internet, now news can travel at the speed of light. And so that's another example of how fast technology progressed and the big difference between that flat world we had in the previous thousand years and the, the very non-flat world that we've had in the last two to three hundred years. One of the, I think, good pieces of this textbook is that it really tries to think about not just economics, but where economics sits within the world, right? So the economy is how we produce things, how we produce goods and services, how we trade them, uh, how we buy and sell them, um, but it sits within society, right? And so we're going to have social norms, we're going to have social institutions that are going to influence the economy. 
Uh, and then that society sits within the biosphere, which is all of the life on Earth, right? So all of the human life, but also all of the animal life, all of the plant life, and those things are going to interact. And then within the biosphere, we have the physical environment, right? Basically uh, the Earth. And so all of these things are going to interact. And one of the things we are going to want to think about is how does the economy, you know, interact with society? How does it interact with the biosphere? And how does it interact with the physical environment? And all of these things are going to be really important to think about. Sometimes the economy interacts well with these things, and sometimes it interacts in a costly manner that we need to take into account. For example, you know, when, with the advent of the Industrial Revolution, we needed energy, right? And the first way we got all of this energy was uh, to burn fossil fuels. So uh, coal first, right? But then oil and gas. Um, and all of that has meant that we have uh, put more and more CO2 into the atmosphere. And so this is just a graph of how much CO2 is in the atmosphere. You can see it was pretty steady for that, those previous thousand years. And then as we started putting more and more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, the overall levels have increased. And this is one of the biggest challenges facing the world, right? But it, especially in economics, is how do we deal with that? How do we control that? What can we do? Um, can we get countries to produce less carbon emissions? Should some countries be able to produce more carbon emissions because they started growing later? And so it's one of the things that we'll talk about uh, a bit in this semester, um, but you know, it's definitely one of the things uh, that is on the top of uh, economists' minds uh, going into the future. We can see that there have been environmental consequences because of this increased CO2, right? So this sort of shows the, the deviation from the temperature between 1961 and 1990, where global warming had already started. And so you can see, you know, from 1700, if we think about really the capitalist revolution starting around 1700, it's been a pretty steady increase. And then recently, it's been a much faster increase. And that's not a big surprise because we've had countries with very large populations uh, finally growing and producing a lot more CO2, and that has had uh, big consequences on uh, climate change. So if we think about the, these environmental consequences, uh, this has to do with you know the expansion of the economy, both uh, nationally and internationally, and the way we do things, right? So do we put a tax on carbon? No, we don't yet, but we could, and that would probably help reduce carbon dioxide emissions. Uh, we could Im, you know, encourage the use of uh, non-fossil fuels, so renewable energy, solar, wind, etc. cetera. Um, and really the, the thing is, is that you know, technological, the technological evolution uh, could be a part of the solution, right? By you know, increasing solar panels, increasing wind turbines, uh, a lot of different opportunities, but we also we have to provide the right incentives in order to make that.